Uh, hello and welcome to the Temple of the Silver Stars uh, public class series, Selections from Magic Without the Tears by Alistair Crowley. Uh, my name is Ruth and with me is Rex, my co-host for this class series. Uh, oh. We are both academic instructors with the Temple of the Silver Star. Rex, did you have something you needed to say? Nope, just saying hello. Hello, okay. <laughs> I thought you said, oh. <laughs> All right. Um, so the Temple of the Silver Star, for those of you unfamiliar with it, we are a nonprofit Thelemic religious organization. Uh, we've been around about 12 years and we provide two tracks of training. We provide academic uh, and initiatory. So right now you're kind of interfacing with our academic side. Um, both tracks are designed to provide preparatory training in ceremonial magic, uh, Raja Yoga, Kabbalah, tarot, astrology, and much more. Uh, using these foundational tools, we seek to guide students towards a deeper apprehension of the true will and the law of Thelema and his or her own psycho-spiritual constitution. So for more information on the Temple of the Silver Star, you can visit our website, totss.org, acronym of our name. And uh, you can learn more about joining our academic track or perhaps becoming an initiate. Um, we have an academic campus, we have several campuses all over the world. Um, we have one in Los Angeles and we have a study group in Seattle. So today um, you're meeting sort of our Seattle and Los Angeles uh, study group campus combo. Uh, Rex is the leader of the Seattle group and um, I've sort of taken on the Los Angeles group as my project. <laughs> and so we'll be co-hosting this series. Uh, we're hoping to run 11 weeks. Um, and do some selections uh, from Magic Without Tears uh, every week. So welcome. <laughs> and if anyone needs a link, uh, Rex just sent it out to the first chapter that we'll be covering uh, from Magic Without Tears uh, called What is Magic? It's the first uh, sort of official chapter. Um, so, and it's available for free on hermetic.com. Uh, Hermetic.com slash Crowley slash Magic Without Tears, <laughs> I believe. Um, and so, you know, just an introduction to this book. It was published in 1951 uh, by Carl Germer, who was one of the students of Aleister Crowley. Um, it's generally accepted uh, as his last book. Um, and it was uh, intended to be sort of called Aleister Explains Everything. Uh, and he sent a circular to his friends and his students uh, asking them to suggest subjects for the inclusion. So I think it has like 85 chapters, 88 chapters, something like that. Um, and so it's a series of letters actually uh, to his, you know, to his students um, from this position in life. He wasn't trying to impress anyone anymore. He was just trying to be a teacher and preserve his writing. So it's basically one of the most uh, accessible text, I believe, <laughs> from Crowley. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read any other Crowley, but it, it's pretty challenging. So this is kind of a little bit uh, dumbed down, I think. <laughs> Although um, it's it's Susie and, and uh, there's a lot of gems in it. So I'm really excited to uh, introduce and, you know, just talk with you all about it. Um, so we'll be having kind of this short intro and then we'll get to discussing stuff and you know your reactions. I hope some of you have read it before and we can talk about it um, a little bit in depth. I'm hoping to keep this to like, you know, 35, 40 minutes just because, you know, <laughs> these discussions can sometimes run hours and um, I don't know if everyone has the time to stay up until midnight, although it would be fun. Uh, so uh, Rex, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, not really. I think this is an interesting collection of letters, like you said. Um, it's Crowley's attempt to be extremely lucid, and um, I've, I've always gotten a kick out of it, uh, you know, in general. Um, it's, he's entertaining. It's kind of Crowley at his best, I think. So um, this first one, obviously, is uh, it strikes me as being a little, a little dry, simply because he lays out all of the theories and postulates, and, um, you know, he, he goes through all of that. But um, is there anyone here who hasn't, who hasn't read this before or who's not familiar with it? Is this your first time reading this? I'm familiar with it. I've never actually read it myself. Just kind of studied it in a group a little bit. Right. 
couple I've of years ago. I've read the whole thing. Okay. Sally, I've read the whole thing. Cool. So we have kind of a spectrum. Some, for some people, it's the first time they've read it. Other people have read it a number of times. So that's that's great. So yeah, well, we can just dive in then if you want. Ruth. Yeah, it definitely gets tossed around as, you know, oh, you should read this first. And um, I remember like when I first started studying Crowley and magic in general, I did sort of read it first and I was a little bit you know, a little bit intimidated. Uh, Robert just pointed out it is fairly expensive if you attempt to get a physical copy. <laughs> so this is true. We're very lucky that um, you know we have it as a uh, hermetic.com uh, <laughs> accessible version. There are PDFs sort of floating around. Of the Israel Regardi uh, wrote the foreword for one in 1970, and I have that sort of on my Kindle. Um, so yeah, let's just dive in, and you can pull it up. Uh, Rex, you did share it in the, um, yes. You, so if you guys want to pull it up at all in your browser and take a look, um, you know, the first chapter is basically like Crowley, part of Crowley's life work <laughs> is this, you know, his axioms and theorems and propositions for what is magic. Um, you know, the really famous sort of uh, definition of magic comes from this, the, the Crowley, you know, the, what is it, the science and art of, uh, you know, affecting change via will, um, the science and art causing change to occur in, in conformity with will comes from this, you know, it's, it's cool. <laughs> um, of course, this is from, uh, a lot of this is from a previous thing that he wrote um, in Magic and Theory and Practice. So, you know, this isn't all totally original, but um, it's appropriate that it's the first uh, sort of letter because he just lays it out here, you know, and he's, the thing that strikes me about Crowley that I love is he's not a superstitious person. You know, he's a believer and he has faith, but he's not like throwing a bunch of crazy things at you that you just have to believe. You know, he says, try it out for yourself. And I think this really is a great example of him laying it out and seeing his thought process behind why he thinks that magic with a K is real. I think too, it's uh, kind of his attempt to lay out magic as a as an actual formal theorem. Um, he starts with that definition and the postulate that follows. And he's following the, you know, from a logical standpoint, he's, uh, you know, from a, a formal logic, uh, an educated logic standpoint, he's, he's breaking it down. Uh, whether it holds together or not, I think that's, you know, I think he's kind of all over the place when he, when he gets to the theorems part of it, but he starts out strong with, uh, you know, his, the definition of magic is is very straightforward. The, the postulate, any required change may be affected by the application of the proper kind and degree of force in the proper manner through the proper medium to the proper objects. I think, you know, this, it, he's basically laying the groundwork here for um, the formula that we all use when we're, when we're doing any kind of magic ritual or when we're invoking any kind of uh, energy, you know, you're, you're basically building up energy, applying that force towards an object, whatever that happens to be, and how accurate you are in terms of the energy you're using, the object that you're aiming at, the, the amount of force you're using, those are all variables that he's laying out in a very scientific way where uh, uh, you, can, you can then test your success and failure based on that. You know, a success is you had all those things right. A failure is something was wrong there, you know, maybe there was a link, the... a link in the chain that broke. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a chain that he's that imagine, you know, yeah. it's a magical chain basically. And, um, and Crowley writes about that extensively. And uh, see, I would like to go back to just the, you know, the first part. I mean, so there's, he sets up this letter, you know, with these three parts and, you know, he defines uh, what um, magic is a science and art of causing change uh, to occur in conformity with will. And, you know, when I was reading this and just thinking about, you know, my training as a, a thelemite, I mean, thelema is the Greek word for will. And so, you know, he builds in this, this true will this, as a core concept to what magic is, you know. Um, you know, in his ethical treaties of duty, he identifies will as the nature of the individual. You know, uh, this capitalized nature uh, is compared to the perfect nature you know, the earlier Gnostic systems, um, you know, so really, like, it starts off with, like, 
will as this very like axis mundi centralized thing. It's you, <laughs> you know? Um, and so you can't really separate yourself from whatever you're hoping to achieve out in the world. You are this sort of central uh, axis of magic. Um, you know, I think that's a really core concept in Thelema, obviously it is, it is Thelema, <laughs> it's will. Agency, yes, Robert, uh, agency. Um, and then, yeah, just looking at the postulate, you know, he brings up like uh, referencing chemistry, chlor chloride of gold, <laughs> you know, I mean, and to me, this, this sort of points at his uh, ideas of scientific illuminism, which was sort of the, the, uh, the equinox, um, you know, the methods of science, the aim of religion, you know, this is Crowley, and it's fun to think about the history of this and him kind of coming out of the Victorian age into this age of like, you know, science is changing the world around him with telephones and, you know, cars and all this technology of the early 20th century and him trying to apply this scientific method to religion. You know, it's, it's like, wow, we kind of need this, <laughs> I think now, you know, the pendulum is, has, uh, has swung. Um, so yeah, just will, and then we go to scientific illuminism as sort of the, the postulate. Um, and also just him bringing up chemistry. Uh, I always think of, if you aren't aware, his teacher was uh, Charles Allen Bennett. Um, and Allen Bennett was an analytical chemist. So he lived with, um, he was a couple years his senior, and he was a Golden Dawn initiate. And Allen Bennett, uh, you know, was an analytical chemist who, I think he's sort of, uh, all of those um, gematria charts in 777, a lot of that was Bennett's work. He was ill of health and, uh, you know, all he could do was kind of get asthma. So he sat at home. <laughs> and I think it was Mathers who gave him the assignment. He's like, work out all this gematria for us. Um, and that was Crowley's teacher. So Crowley was taught by an analytical chemist. And I believe he had some analytical uh, chemistry training in his high school days. Um, so a little tidbit there. Um, so yeah, just coming back to the text, uh, you know, postulate two, any required change may be affected by application of the proper kind and degree of force in the proper manner with the proper medium to the proper object. Doesn't say anything about spirits, doesn't say anything about demons, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're not trying to like hocus pocus right now. We're just trying to define things. And I, I love, like I said, I love that about Crowley, you know, how he brings the scientific method um, just into religion and wants us to use it. I think too, he, um, you know, we can see here that uh, this, this theory can be applied to all kinds of different things. So you're, you're, you can be talking about magic. You can talk, talk about, uh, you know, evoking demons if you want, or, uh, using a magic ritual to find a lost watch or to find you know, some other lost object, or um, you could even apply this, a lot of these theories to just general will. Am I doing my will? Um, and how well am I doing my will? So it's, and, and of course that can apply to all kinds of everyday activities and, and situations. So, you know, it's a broad enough definition that it, I think it applies to gosh, almost everything. It's surprisingly practical too. <laughs> it's, it's just good practical advice that, you know, uh, I think he really uh, later, you know, he sort of says this, but it's really about efficiency. It's understanding like, what is, what is the thing I'm holding? What is it supposed to do? You know, um, there is some creativity behind it, but a lot of it is just really very practical. Um, I remember like years ago, I was standing in like a post office line and someone was too close to me and I kept like wishing they would well, you know, like in my mind, like, please get away from me. And then I just sort of changed my posture a little aggressively. And the person like got away from me. <laughs> and I realized, you know, I had been trying to like develop tele, you know, telepathy to get this person away from me. Well, all I had to do was, you know, use my physicality, <laughs> which is much more practical. So I think, um, you know, like as a magician, you should, you should try to think about that, right? Thank you, yeah. Um, sometimes the answer isn't like, oh, I want a million dollars. It's what do I want to buy with a million dollars? Why can't I just 
find that thing? Like, why do I need to have, you know, money to buy a thing when maybe that thing is uh, easily obtainable in a way that doesn't require, you know, um, the, the link of money. So I think, uh, I think that's a really cool and interesting way to look at um, and, and apply this sort of work to. Um, and so, yeah, so the first two are the definition and the postulate. And then we have all these theorems, <laughs> tons and tons of theorems. Um, some of them are great. Some of them kind of uh, are grouped together. And some of them, you know, uh, I think are worthy of commenting upon. Uh, Rex, did you have any? Well, I think, out? yeah, I mean, these first few, I think, kind of just reinforce the idea that these that uh, you're creating a magical link, you know, in, in, in efforts of, uh, you know, performing magic. So the definition of what success is, the definition of what failure is, um, the, uh, you know, the, the fact that, um, I mean, he throws in every, every man and every woman is a star, which kind of feels like it comes out of left field in a way, but obviously it ties into his overall overarching uh, philemic Thelemic ideas, um, but then he's he's constantly re reinforcing here in these first maybe ten or so um, how magic is working. So um, you know he defines success and failure, and then he's he's talking in number um, let's see I think in number number eight, a man whose conscious will is at odds with his true will is wasting his strength. He cannot hope to influence influence his environment efficient, efficiently. This is, um, you know, this is where he's getting into the idea of how we're using our energy, how we're using um, the magic that we're using. Is it in line with our true will? If it is, then you're going to have a whole lot of momentum behind you. If you're not, you're going to you're going to be swimming upstream. Um, and that's, I think that's a, a good uh, example of what it feels like when you're not necessarily doing your will. Um, although the topic of true will is obviously a large topic. Uh, it's a totally separate, separate discussion, but it ties into everything that Crowley is talking about here. Um, yeah, a man Stephen has a, a question just about, uh, oh, yeah. Crowley talks about opening up to vibrations that we may not normally be sensitive to. Is there a certain universal vibration that is a specific goal to attract? I would say that's part of the true will um, and being a, and the efficiency of true will. So, you know, kind of within the idea of high magic, uh, you know, transcendental magic um, is that you align yourself with your true nature and you become almost like a, a channel of force for the highest. So, you know, if you think of the human body as a Kabbalistic tree and you're plugged in to Kether, you know, you have this high energy. When you align yourself perfectly um, with your true will, you become sort of uh, the universal vibration, I would say, you know, and that's what affects, uh, you know, the high magic. Um, that's what that, that's what allows you to become just this really magical being is is that alignment with all of nature itself. You know, you become this, this perfectly efficient wire that doesn't have any noise and, you know, perfectly transmits the energy of the highest into the, the universe. Would you say that's something, Rex, that aligns with? Yeah, how definitely. You think of it? Uh, definitely, and, and I, I think that there's not maybe. The way to think about it, the way I think about it anyway, is that there's not a certain vibration that you're looking for. It's more like you're looking for your own vibration. Um, we are all stars, you know, the, um, and we all have our own path. We have our own true will. And so um, I think as long as you're aiming towards your own highest aspiration in all of these things, that's the vibration you should be going for, not somebody else's or Crowley's idea of what the vibration, you know, is. It's um, we're really in a lot of ways, we're working on our own model and our own tree of life when it comes to that. So um, that would be my only comment there is that it's not, you know, there's not like a particular vibration that everyone should be looking for other than their own unique vibration. I always think of it as, you know, if you're playing a, a reed instrument, you know, finding the vibration of that reed, that's kind of the nature of the reed and the resonance. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, so another thing I, um, and Christian brings a, a clash proves that one or other straight from the course, um, 
and what does it mean? There are courses that would never naturally clash. So uh, coming back to Rex talking about, you know, the, the quote from um, the book of the law, every man and every woman is a star. Um, I like that he adds this in here and he talks about uh, every man and every woman being a star and how these stars, every star has its own course and it won't clash if it's, if you're aligned with your true will, you won't have a clash with someone else if they're aligned with their true will. And I think this really preserves um, everyone's human rights, <laughs> you know? I think uh, if you're doing your will, um, your will should never be to interfere with someone else's true will. You know, if you, if you think that uh, to succeed in your goal or your true will is to subject someone else to some, you know, to your own will, whether it's for their own good or not, that's not doing your true will. And Crowley adds that in, you know, I think a lot of people misunderstand the Lima because they think it is about, you know, sort of this, I know Satanism has kind of this, I am a person and I'm powerful and I'm going to do what I want, <laughs> you know, and uh, Thelema is not Satanism. Thelema is about finding your true will and doing it and allowing other people to find their true will and do it. <laughs> so, you know, when he talks about not clashing, I, I believe that's kind of what he's, you know, referring to. Yeah, and I think, I don't think that it means that there will never be a clash. You know, it's not like, um, I mean, in theory, if everyone is doing their will, there would be less conflict for sure, because everyone's doing their own, they're minding their own business, they're on their own track. Um, but that is to say that um, if someone else is just like totally interfering with other people, um, <clears throat> not necessarily following their true will, uh, but more like interfering with others, that's where you've got the clashes, I think that Crowley's talking about here. Um, but yeah, clearly, I mean, the world is filled with conflict and whether that applies to um, someone's will interfering with someone else's, um, it's a little hard for us to make those determinations, definitely. But um, I, don't, I don't think it's actually Crowley saying that there will be never, that all problems will be solved if everyone's doing their will, because I think that's, that's a little too, that's a little too uh, much hyperbole. I don't think Crowley would ever say that. That's too happy of a world. <laughs> yeah, Crowley to yeah. live into. <laughs> no, and and no, it's just not realistic. But um, but I think in terms of the, it, of people attempting to follow their to find and follow their true will and to do their true will, um, as long as that doesn't involve messing with other people's will or interfering with what their true will is, then it should be aligned as well as possible. And Gypsy is bringing up a good point, like straying from our course and clashing in a way, she says, is a way to find one's footing in the path through discomfort, difference, uh, what we don't want to do versus what we do want to do. You know, and that's true. You kind of um, sort of have to face, you know, difficulties in order to know who you are. I think he brings that up in, um, is it 22? I made a note because I was like, oh, yeah, that's totally magical. Um, yeah, so theorem 22, uh, every individual is essentially sufficient to himself, but he is unsatisfactory unsatis to himself unless he establishes himself in the right relation with the universe. So, you know, that process of discovering your true will, um, to me, it really aligns with like the sort of work that a magician, an adept, a yog yogi has to take on in order to become an adept. Um, you know, you have to like have the discipline to do the meditation, to learn and memorize things and, you know, how you perform with those tasks sort of like tells you who you are, you know, it comes back to that know yourself, um, you know, if you just assume you're a genius, that's fine, <laughs> but you'll never know sort of how far your genius goes until you say, okay, I'm going to try something really hard and see how I do. And it is in that process of limitation that you discover, you know, your, your own shape of yourself. You know, if you kind of never really venture onto the path and truly have uh, those discoveries, then you never sort of know who you are. Um, so... <laughs> Robert is asking, how would you know if clashing is wrong or right? You can't. You need to reconcile yourself to the paradox of being active in the world. So yes. Thank I think you. that's true. Yeah, Thank totally. You. 
and uh, yeah, a person's sense of themselves is separate from and opposed to the universe is a bar to the conducting their current insulates them. Um, yeah, I would say so. Um, let's see. Oh, he does talk about, uh, I remember in 21, he kind of talks about that sort of separation uh, from the universe. Um, there is no limit to the extent of the relations of any man with the universe in essence, for as soon as man makes himself one of any idea, the means of measurement cease to exist. But his power to utilize that force is limited by his mental power and capacity by the circumstance of his human environment. Um, and that brought to mind that old Buddhist joke of what did the what did the Buddhist monk say to the hot dog stand? Make me one with everything. You know, um, the non-duality that Crowley comes back to a lot of you know, which is like a, a precept of Raja, Raja yoga practices and, you know, concentrating on something to the point where you can't tell if you're the thing you're concentrating on or if you're yourself, sort of the dissolving of those boundaries. Did you hear about the Buddha's vacuum? It comes with no attachments. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, wow. <laughs> you're here all week. Alpha 93. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he acknowledges the role of the environment along with true will. Yeah. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left of my idea of doing a short um, intro to this chapter. Uh, if you guys want to just open up, we can have some discussion. If you guys have any reactions to you know, the text or to just our conversations, uh, please feel free to use your mic or if you type, I can repeat what you said. Um, see a lot of friends online that I know have good things to say. <laughs> uh, well, I, I just started on the academic, um, on the academic track and I've been reading uh, Libra CL and I found that I was following on studying um, uh, Book of the Law. That was a beautiful elaboration of the ideas in that. And this is sort of, to me, this is sort of the next step where he's really laying out um, what's in Libra CL in a, a much more methodical kind of uh, rigorous way, which is really, really great because you start to see the the echoes of one work and the other, and it's very consistent, which makes it easier to, uh, to study for sure. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Welcome to the academic track too. Happy to have you. And you can, uh, if you're if you're watching this uh, live, you get credit for it <laughs> as hours. So write it down. And uh, if you're watching it in a video, you have to write a report about it. So better to join us live if you can. Um, someone is going to ask. Oh yes. So that is how it works. Um, yeah, it's funny too if you read the Israel Regardi. Uh, introduction. Yes, please inform your instructor you were here too. <laughs> Robert says, um, you know, if you read the Israel Regardi uh, introduction, he talks about there's a few like weird footnotes and he writes about uh, this, this guy he references, I think his name is uh, Almonds. He's this uh, a French person that he's like, Oh, yes, and my friend Almond wants to talk about this. Uh, Gerard Almond. Um, but Gerard Amman is like his companion. I believe he went to the desert with him and wrote uh, The Vision and the Voice. Um, I believe it's the same person. I know he did a tr French translation of the Book of the Law, but uh, actually every quotation that's supposed to be from Gerard Amman is actually a, a Crowley wrote it and just didn't want to take credit for it. <laughs> so <laughs> there's some cool tidbits in the Israel Regardi um, introduction. Uh, and I'm hoping maybe we can cover the three schools of magic uh, the next time um, that we get together. Those are uh, chapters six, seven, and eight. Um, and they talk about sort of black and white magic and sort of the in-between path of yellow magic. Um, let's see, we have some stuff coming up. Yes, Gypsy, it is in uh, being in relationship with everything, the intimacy of knowing the true nature of self and other which kind of eliminates the worry about working against it or thwarting it when there's true understanding. Um, yeah, it's very Buddhist to me, like 
you know, Buddhism uh, and Alan Bennett, uh, as I referenced before, Crowley's teacher is kind of uh, known as like the person who brought Buddhism to England, to the UK. He was like the second person ever to be uh, initiated as a Theravada um, Buddhist monk, you know, in like 1902. Um, see. So I, I, I think, you know, Buddhism really did have a huge effect on him, uh, kind of just accepting uh, your true nature and going beyond the limitations of your ego. Um, I'm not in a particular group. I paid for this class, but when I reapply in January, um, I'm not sure if this would count towards your track. You watched it now. Uh, you could write a reaction paper on it and hand it in later. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, you know, if, if you want to go back and re and it would be technically rewatching this one and writing a reaction paper, I think that probably would, would um, that would count, but you could work that out with your, with your instructor. And Robert notes that Bennett became an actual Buddhist saint. That's very cool. <laughs> yeah, Alan Bennett, uh, I think I share a birthday with him. So I'm always like, what, what did he do? <laughs> Maybe I'm his reincarnation. <laughs> Not really. Nice. It's one of the things if you read Crowley, he's always talking about, you know, how many reincarnations he is of Eliphius Levy and, you know, who else does he claim? Everyone in the list of saints, I believe, <laughs> the Gnostic math. <laughs> early reincarnation. Um, yeah. One thing that kind of bothered me about this book was that um, we don't get to read the original letters. I think it would be really interesting to be able to, I don't know that any of them exist. Um, mm -hmm. I know I've talked to people who are archivists and they collect Crowley stuff and I, I don't believe the original letters were ever preserved. I think only Crowley's responses. So, um, sort of the but, B sides. Exactly. Yeah, you get the you get the B side, which is probably the more important side. But um, it would it would be nice to to yeah, be able to read those. Uh huh. Yeah, totally. That would be cool. And one thing that um, the Temple of Silver Star does do, we have a uh, you know our, our publishing arm. We have a few books that are letters. You know, Phyllis Seckler uh, has written you know a lot of correspondences. Uh, mostly with Carl Germer, but we have a book of Carl Germer's letters. So if you're interested in correspondences in the Salemic um, era of the 20th century, um, you know, the Temple of the Silver Star does have some of that. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of letters to Crowley. <laughs> yeah, but they, <laughs> they published Jane Wolfe's Jane Wolf's diaries and um, Sora Merrill letters and Germer letters. Yeah, they're great. Um, and yeah, so Robert just says Buddhism is what Crowley refers to as the yellow school. Um, okay, <laughs> so we'll, we'll be covering uh, the white, black, and yellow schools. I, do you want to do that next time, Rex? Should we cover yeah. those? Yeah, that sounds good, unless anybody else has a better suggestion, but that sounds like a good next next uh, step. We've talked about theory of magic, now let's talk about the schools. Yeah, it's three chapters, but they're pretty, in, it's a pretty important sort of, um, you know, sum, summation of what Crowley thinks of as, you know, that, you know, black magic and white magic. And, you know, that becomes pretty important uh, when you're especially talking to people who don't know a lot about Crowley. You know, they're often like, isn't he evil? Doesn't he, you know, <laughs> do black magic? And um, so it's great to hear what is black magic? What is white magic from uh, the source itself? Uh, so those are chapters six, seven, and eight that uh, hopefully will get read and covered next week. Uh, anyone else have anything they want to just add to the magic without tears? What is magic, Malou? Bef Malou, before we uh... any anything that stood out? Yeah. Um, yes, number twenty three. Magic is the science of understanding oneself and one's conditions. It's the art of applying that understanding in action. Jason says yeah, he just wants to comment that the more work. The more work that I do, knowing myself, is that the I seems to be shifted more towards, say, my star or nature, hadit, etc., rather than my ego. And when I act in line with that, rather than my little ego self, my life is pretty easy, like going with a stream. I think that's a good description of, um, of magic and also applying magic to will. Um, you know, there's a lot. Some other theorems in here too saying that you know when you're following your true will you've got the inertia of the universe behind you 
Um, and I think, I think we've all experienced that feeling from time to time when things are going really great. You know, we make a decision to, to go in a particular direction and doors open and it, it's a great feeling. And I think that's, that kind of ties in with this. Yeah, and he means inertia in like the sense of uh, being like a you know a physics of you know um, the, the mechanical world, you know, right. not not inertia like oh I can't move, but more like everything in the universe is moving behind me and coming. <laughs> coming yeah, once coming, once it starts going, it keeps behind. going. <laughs> yes, yes. Sweet. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Um, you know, bring your questions. Uh, next time. Um, I love it uh, in the book Magic when Crowley signs off as all his grades or layers of being that seems to exist to him all at once, right? Non-linear. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and hopefully we'll see you next week. We kept this short and sweet. Uh, <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll say the video is over for now and if we want to keep talking we can. Um, I just wanted to wrap it up for because I was a producer in a former life and <laughs> do this a lot. <laughs> yeah, so well, thank you both. Yeah, thanks yeah. so much for being here. It's yeah, really great. Thank you. thank you. Have a good week. Next week. Great to see you. Yeah, we'll, days, everyone. we'll see you next week.